the birthday wishes. I am 33 years and 360 months old. There, there you go. I have to do the math on that, which is not my strong. I was going to say, let's see how fast you can do the math. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's that's uh, that's more difficult math than the 18.6 percent that signed up for virtual academy. Radio, and, right? and see, I'm not very good with this virtual learning, so I'm not going to be able to figure that out. <laughs> I was absent the day they taught math in school. Yes. So Gary, they had the meeting uh, last night. Uh, can can you tell us? Yes. Uh, can you tell us what happened and and what do we know for sure, and what it, what still might be subject to change? Well, we know for right now that we are opening under Plan B, with the options for parents to go uh, full virtual, which is Plan D. Uh, it, it's officially closed, but if folks have parents accidentally signed up for B and they want to transition to D, I'm sure the school principal will work with you. But we talked about the safety procedures, the cleaning procedures we have in, in place, the hard work the UCP staff, the UCPS staff is doing to prepare our teachers for the virtual environment and prepare our facilities for the kids to come back to school on August 17th. Okay. Um, you know, CMS uh, under, went... Let me just go into... It might be helpful if I go into a little detail sure under thing. Plan B. Yes. Uh, the way that is set right now is students in... Uh, well, first of all, a Wolf School and South Providence and certain uh, EC uh, specialty classes will be going back four days a week starting the first day of school. Okay. Uh, so they are going to be on, in the building four days a week. Uh, if any parents have any questions, they should reach out to the, the, princip the appropriate principal of the school. Okay. Uh, under Plan B, because what happened in the governor's uh, pronouncement back on July 14th is changed from a capacity issue to a dis uh, distancing requirement. So we are required to maintain for the students six foot distancing. So what that means is we had to reduce the classroom size in order to meet those requirements. Now, if you remember the legislature, so, uh, years, uh, two years ago, I believe it was, passed legislation for mandating smaller classroom sizes in K through three, down to 20 students per classroom. So uh, that's, it's a little easier there. And then other grades all the way through 12, uh, we're going to a, basically you have fo four cohorts of the, the class. So your student, your if you select B, will go to classroom one day a week and then will be virtual at four days a week. Now, this is the way we're starting. Here's, here's the opportunity or the challenge, depending on the way you want to look at it. We know so far how many parents have signed up for option D. Yes. What we don't know, and there's understandably there's been a lot of uh, some confusion, there have been parents that have signed up for B for whatever reason, but they do not intend to send their children to class. In other words, they want to go all virtual, but they selected B because of, you know, some whatever reasons so it's going to be critical for us the first three weeks of school we're going to as a course taking attendance and very strict procedures of following up with parents of students who don't have signed up for b but their their child is not uh, uh appearing in the classroom he doesn't report to class on his assigned day so after we have that data, we will have a better census for each um, great, you know, elementary, middle, and high school, and it may present the opportunity to enhance the number of days of in the class uh, work for students and still conform to the requirements. Okay, let, and, let, let me ask you something. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, 
why would a parent sign up for B uh, when they really want D and they have no intention of their child going to school one day a week? I think there were some uh, miscommunications that if parents were unsure what they wanted to do, I see. sign up for B because if you uh, sign up for D, we're asking for a first semester commitment. True. So, you know, you can't just switch over to B. And I think there was also some miscommunication that if you're in B, uh, you're going to have the classroom teacher all the way through. And so with D, you might have another teacher. You're not going to have the same classroom teacher mm -hmm. uh, that you would have had if you're reporting to the classroom. So some parents wanted to stay with the same teacher. You know, we're going to have teachers that are going to specialize in the virtual option. I see. Okay. So and and so there may be some that are signed up for B, and they don't intend to send their their uh, child into into class. Yeah. Um, and we will be tracking that and following up. I specifically asked about that. We're not just going to sit back and take attendance. We have a lot of experience. We do this normally. We send out tracers, you know, where are you? Did something happen? Did you move? Yeah. Did you decide to homeschool? Did you uh, just decide, make a mistake and not sign up for D and you intend to go virtual? So we can track that data and get an accurate census of actually how many kids we're going to have in the classroom. Okay, let, let me ask you this hypothetically. Okay. Let, let's say that, that there are none of those people. Let's say that everybody okay. that signed up for B, that's what they intend to do. Yep. Um, other than that, we had almost 19% of all students opt, opt for D. Is, yes. is that figure alone enough to open school up to more than one day per week? Well, here's, here's the challenge. We don't want to take this on a school-by-school -school basis. So you might have schools, and I'll just... The best example I can think of off the top of my head is, is Fairview. They have a lower school population overall. If you turn them loose right now, they could probably do the distancing with, uh, you know, they, we could get the staff in there. They could probably conform right now. But you, you need it needs to be a system-wide decision. I see. Now, this is my own personal opinion, so take it for that. I'm one of nine. Uh, this is just me. My biggest concern, I, I have two student groups that I have the biggest concern that I hope will be able to, I, I intend to try all I can to find a way to resolve. The remaining EC students, I think remote learning four days a week is a real challenge, Yes, to say the least. I'd like to see them in the building as soon as possible. I also think our kindergartners and first graders, mm -hmm. they are just not set up. We do not have the equipment. And I think they are the other student population that I personally believe is the most critical to get into the building. Yeah. So the questions I have asked is, uh, you know, we have a school building. We have a gym. We have a cafeteria. Some have mobile classrooms. We even have a school that has an outdoor classroom set up for certain subject matter. And there's a model that I'm a, personally a proponent of, which is for elementary students, a two recess per day. Uh, you have a recess in the morning, you have a recess in the afternoon to give the kids a break. I have advocated for utilizing all the space in the school a uh, two recess per day model and if we have the available staff to cover all that can we still move the ec students and the kindergartners and the first graders into more days uh in class instruction okay now did and again the data will will help us determine that did, did you not say, though, that the EC students in the Wolf School and Providence uh, are, are already determined that they'll go four days a week? The, the most significant.
certificate uh, uh, EC students, yes, they're, they're, they will, uh, self-contained classes, et cetera. But uh, there are other EC students as well that are not a, um, as high a, a level that uh, we can't accommodate all of them. Okay. You know, EC students range from everywhere from you, you have an IEP and, um, uh, to severe physical uh, mental challenges and so um, yeah. there's there's a whole spectrum uh-huh. of EC students but I'm hoping that at some point we can accommodate most if not all. Well my, my question would be uh, me being a working parent and I'll probably be the one in charge of making sure they do what they're supposed to do. Um, yes. Th- we have chosen D just because um, I, okay. of the to me, wearing a mask eight hours a day is tough for me. I'm not going to expect them to try and do it. Are they going to be expected to be on at a certain time, or is this going to be something that I can do when I get home from work, say, 2, 3 o'clock, to get them started? Or Are they going to have to do it on their own? Uh, both. It, it will be available on on demand, if okay. you will, as well as through a regu- regular schedule. Okay. And they won't be um, penalized for, for going uh, on demand? No. Okay, good. No. Okay. Uh, I had another one. And another question. I know that we've we've had teachers that uh, did the motor protest and stuff. Is there yeah. any concern that some of these teachers are not going to show up and you're going to be understaffed? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, again, as we won't know how many students show up, we won't yeah. know for sure about our uh, teacher population. Yes. It, it's... Uh, it's a very emotional issue, as I witnessed firsthand and, and have had received numerous emails from our educators, and I want to acknowledge those concerns. Uh, am I going to sit here and say that there's no way in the world I guarantee no one will ever test positive? That That's foolish. Uh, I, what I can promise is we're doing everything humanly possible. I personally have studied the data provided by the county and the state, and I can get into that further, some questions I have on that, but uh, I also have a, a rising eighth grader, so I've got to get in the game, and, and I have seen from a not only an academic standpoint, but also from a social and emotional standpoint how he's been affected mm-hmm. since we closed down in March. And uh, you have to weigh the the um, health challenges um, a- as well as the social and emotional aspect. If you think about it, if you have, if, if you're, I don't know what age your children are, but if you had someone, a, a child who was a kindergartner last year, and we closed school on the 13th of March, I believe it was, so they didn't they didn't get to finish their kindergarten year uh, all through summer you know, and then now we're starting in the fall virtual which basically means they're going to school one day a week uh, it, that's that's a big gap in mm-hmm. your development from an academic standpoint as well as, well as social emotional in you know being around your peers and learning to follow the rules and be respectful of others and all that kind of thing yep. to me that that's a significant gap and i worry about these students you know when the day comes and we do get back to normal it's going to be a lot of catch up oh yeah and uh, it's a real challenge so i had to wait for my family as well the uh, um, negatives and the positives and I felt like uh, overall that we need to offer it, it, it's not about making anybody do anything yeah to me it's about offering more choices for parents to do what they feel is best yeah um, you decided on D more yep. power to you that's right I've decided on B for my son that's that's the way it goes and there are some frankly that have pulled their kids out that are going to homeschool or go to private school or what have you and i respect whatever decision the parents make my goal was just to offer as many choices as possible now are there any plans in place for what happens let's say if uh, one elementary school 
you know, has some, some folks test positive? Are there plans yes. in place for that? Yes. yes. Our staff, uh, particularly Jared McCraw, on our senior leadership team is working very closely with the county health department and they have very specific guidelines if a teacher would test you know or staff member as you know more than just mm-hmm. teachers in the building but if anyone would test positive there's a very strict procedure you go through as far as how you handle that positive tested person as well as what you do for if they're a teacher their class uh what you would do for um um for any of the other um um well, well, people get, in, in the school building gary get get, get into uh, how, the how you would handle their return as well okay i want you to get into the nuts and bolts of that okay what what well, is that pro- test. i'm not an expert i'm still learning no i understand but let's best. say you know a child test positive or, or a, a yes. cafeteria staff or some other member of staff what right what what right. happens well the, the key is well, first of all with a, a student they're going to get their temperature taken and they're going to ask them and questions before they get in the building yeah so if a student tests, or even a staff member, because they're going to be tested as well before they go in the building. I was tested last night before I went into the PDC for the uh, board meeting. If their temperature comes up above 100.4, then that student will be, there's a special uh, set-aside area uh, where they will be uh, quarantined and parents contacted. Now, that doesn't mean they're positive. And we don't do, UCPS does not undertake COVID testing. We're we're not doing that. That would be the parent, their physician, you know, what have you to handle. But we're going to intercede if if there are any of those symptoms that appear. The same goes for a staff member. Now, it's not, there are many variables. So if a teacher tests positive, doesn't automatically mean we're going to lock down the class or we're going to make the class go all virtual. They're going to do all kinds of tracing and try and determine what's, you know, where this is coming from. Um, now, of course, there could be situations where there are, you know, I don't know what the variables could be, but there could be multiple things that happen that cause a classroom to go all virtual or even in a very extreme case, a whole school to go virtual for a certain period of time. But I want to assure people that there are very clear guidelines, policies, and procedures, and our staff is working hand-in-hand with the county health department so everybody's on the same page as how we handle a student uh, positive, uh, a teacher positive, another staff member positive. Okay. Is there, uh, because people want to know, Gary, um, is there, can, can people go to the Union County Public School website or their Facebook page? Is there a place to pull all this information from? Yes, yes, there are numerous sources. Uh, let me pull up the website real quick. And I actually did it last night during the meeting. It was so easy to find. You can go to uh, ucpsk12.nc.us. And when you pull up the website on the left, top left corner, there is an explore. And the second item down is a drop down box is the reopening of schools 2020-2021. And it, it, it works all the way through that. Okay. Uh, it gives you contacts. It's keeping you safe, guidance for instruction, health, and safety. It gives you links to uh schedules calendars nutrition services transportation links to the lighting our way forward nc guidebook to reopening schools which are a lot of the the health guidelines and how we will handle certain situations cdc resources uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, the Union County, uh, all that information. And okay. it, it describes in detail the instructional model B, D, uh, schedules, health and safety, a, a plethora of information available. Gary, that that's great. 
but I can't get to the website. So you're going to have to tell me again and go slow. All right. All right. UCPS dot K12. Dot K12. Okay. Yeah. Dot NC dot US. Site cannot be reached. Did you put that WW in front first? Yeah, let me do it That's again. Dot, uh, UCPS dot K12. Well, you give me your, you give me your uh, email, dot, uh, or I'll get it from you afterwards here, and I'll send you the link. And no, you can post I, I, it up I, I, on I, your I, site as well. No, I've, I've got it now. I just want to okay. make sure I, I want to make sure our listeners have it. Uh, uh, operator error. Operator error. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, you, There's one thing I wanted to discuss because I've been I've been following the data as, as best I can, uh, and I, I want to commend the county health department because we we had numerous questions about hospitalizations, and they've added that data to the website. Before it was just number of infections, number of deaths, uh, number of of those recovered, are no longer monitored. They call them, and. Uh, doing some digging and then they added the information about the current number of hospitalizations right and the overall since they started tracking number of hospitalizations and inquiring even further uh of the current hospitalizations last yesterday when i checked it may be updated we have 15 current hospitalizations and that's for atrium union and H anybody that's been transferred to charlotte <laughs> 15 that uh, of the current hospitalizations zero are in the age grouping of 20 or younger i see uh let so me that, let me ask that, you gary to know. how much of a financial hit is the uh or union county public schools taking on on this i mean you know well, I'm, there are additional costs to uh implement this school year of sure. some eight million dollars and the CARES Act is supplied about half that. And so we are hoping for legislation on the federal level that will replenish those funds. Mm -hmm. But the real, uh, the real, when the rubber hits the road, is going to be, as you know, on the 20 and 40 day enrollment numbers. That's when the state sets our allotments based on our attendance. Uh -huh. Now, there has, it has been proposed, and we don't have any uh, real response or action yet, to freeze the funding formulas, the funding levels, at this past year's rate. Uh, so what could happen is your 20-year numbers come in, and they give you a leeway of, you know, 100 or so or 200 students either way, more or under, before they change the formula. But, you know, if we, if we come in and combination of B and D, we have 10% less students. Um, well, no, it did take more than that because we, you know, if you take into account how many are going with D and how many are going with B, and still our enrollment is 10% less than it, what it was last year, that would mean we would have less a lot allotment for positions and potentially um, reductions in our force. Mm -hmm. It's if if things are not addressed to give us the leeway to cope with the situation, the way the state funds the schools, uh, taking on a, a student headcount, and if we and of course we don't know yet until the kids start showing up for school or don't show up for school in our 20 and 40 day numbers there could yes be a financial hit right okay we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that uh, you gained a new uh, member uh last yes. night um reverend uh, jimmy benson uh, senior was appointed by the board of education to fill a, a vacant yes, uh, at large seat I, I, i've known jimmy for a good while he's good a good man. friend yep uh has served on the board previously, and I think he's going to be a great addition to the team, and uh, I'm looking forward to him. I have a vacancy on my curriculum committee, so I am looking forward to his contributions on the curriculum committee. Okay, 
And I know y'all met a few days ago. Anything come out of that meeting? Uh, who met? The curriculum committee. Oh, well, we're just, we're, it's a lot of getting contracts in place. I see. Um, a lot of um, systems, softwares that we use that contract renewals. There really wasn't anything earth shattering, frankly. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gary. There is one thing I wanted to bring up about COVID numbers that's been interesting to me, if I can. Sure. In, in, I mentioned studying these numbers before in the county website. There's been a lot of discussion about, well, we shouldn't do this or open this until we hit the benchmark of, say, the, the 5% uh, in, in positive um, testing rate. One of the challenges I've noticed um, is that you can, the, the county will direct you to the state site and shows the current percentage or what they calculate the current percentage. But I have yet to find the exact numbers of tests conducted for Union County. Now, I can do my own math, but, you know, I, I would like more than just a bar chart and it's saying the positive testing rate is 10%. Well, I would like to know how many are tested and, if possible, dive even deeper and know more about the demographics of those that are being tested. Because if you think about it, why are you getting tested in the first place? Well, you might be a high risk in a high risk area. Uh, you might be in a nursing home where there's been an outbreak. You, you might be a more susceptible part of the population. So, you know, if, if we're not testing people who are, you know, randomly who are asymptomatic or don't have it or just, you know, like we test every police officer, um, then maybe that 10% uh, positive testing rate is skewed because of the population that's being tested. I, I don't know, but those are just questions I have. Sure. I, I think they're, they're reasonable questions, particularly if uh, authorities are going to utilize a certain positive testing rate, say a 5%, to determine what's going to happen in our state, then I think it's only reasonable to ask questions about how you're coming, what data are you using to come up with what you're telling us our te current testing rate is. And that's just a question that, and, and frankly, I haven't been able to find the answer anywhere where that data is available. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, Gary, we always ap appreciate your uh, your time. Um, so barring any, uh, in, any major changes, we're waiting for the first several weeks of school to get underway starting uh, the 17th of this month. Yes. And based on those numbers, it may open the possibility for more than one day a week uh, learning under Plan B. I'm just going to speak for myself. As I mentioned earlier, I think we need to look at every available option to get our remaining EC students and particularly our, our, our pre and K and first graders back in the building for as much face to face instruction as safe and as humanly possible to accomplish using any options that the powers that be feel is viable. That's just me personally. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Gary, thanks again for your thanks, time. Gary. I really appreciate it. Gentlemen, I hope you have a great day. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Sure All right. Thanks. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, man. Yeah, no, and we appreciate uh him doing that and we will post that uh that website and again i'll, I'll give it to you um, it's just one of these you know government type of things with a lot of dots in it mm -hmm. uh it's ucps for union county public schools ucps dot k12 the letter k12 dot nc dot us and then follow the uh you know a lot of pull down yeah. menus and that kind of thing you can do it all right we'll take a break we'll be back